Well, I'm uh, very happy that I have an opportunity to present some of our recent data at this uh, summit. Uh, the uh, data are focused on the um, effects of silicones on cultured cells. Uh, and uh, more specifically, we focused on low molecular weight silicones and um, the induction of cell death. My name is uh, Gerd Kruin. I'm a professor of biomolecular chemistry at the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Uh, and our research is uh, focused on autoimmunity. And this is also the field uh, in which we became interested in, in the effects of, of silicones, uh, particularly in relation to the Asia. Uh, syndrome and, and the immunological aspects associated with the more recently defined uh, breast implant illness. So it will be uh, quite well known to you that uh, silicon breast implants are filled with silicon gels. And the main component of uh, silicon gels is uh, polydimethyl siloxane, uh, PDMS in short. Um, which is also cross-linked in order to, uh, to form the gel-like structure. And during the, the process of uh, production of these gels, uh, there's also a number of low molecular weight silicones uh, generated, like, and this is the most uh, pronounced, uh, prominent uh, compound, uh, the, the so-called D4 silicon, which is a cyclic silicon uh, consisting of four uh, units of a siloxane. In addition to D4, there's also D5 and D6, which are quite similar, but just a little bit larger. I will come back to that later. So it's already known for a long time that the uh, uh, molecules in an implant can actually bleed from the implant. They pass the uh, PDMS sh shell of the implants and then in the uh, environment of the implant, they will form small droplets, micro droplets as we call them. Uh, and these micro droplets can then be taken up by uh, macrophages uh, or they main, are maintained as micro droplets and in either in the, in the context of macrophages or as small droplets, they can be distributed all through the body. There's, Find some evidence that they can end up in, in very different tissues. So we asked ourselves, what is the uh, effect of silicones on, on cells, on human cells, when cells are exposed to these silicon micro droplets? Um, so until relatively recently, it was believed that silicones are uh, inert. And when cells are exposed to silicons, nothing will happen. Well, we wanted to investigate this in, in a laboratory setting. So what we did is we, uh, we took D4 and the other low molecular weight silicons. We generated micro droplets of these oily substances in the, uh, the culture medium, and then added the, added the culture medium to uh, cultured cells, which under the microscope look like, like this. And we uh, asked ourselves, what is the effect of this procedure on cell viability? And now I'm going to show you two movies in order to illustrate what we actually observed. The movie on the left is actually this, the control cells, which are not exposed to D4. And what you will see is the, uh, what will happen uh, with the cells in a period of uh, about 16 hours. And what you, what you will see is that not, nothing much will happen. The cells move around a little bit and some of the cells, you know, the movie starts again, some of the cells will divide like, the, like this one here. Um, so as I said, nothing much will happen except for cell division. If we now expose the same cells to D4, then the movie on the right will illustrate what happens in the beginning, nothing much does happen, although the morphology of the gels slightly changes. There's no cell division anymore. And at some point after eight hours or so for these cells, you see that the cells more or less explode or implode, uh, which is a, a sign of cell death. 
and show the movie once again. So just look at the different cells. You see that the uh, morphology slightly changes and then at some point they, uh, they die. So this was a clear indication of, uh, of cell death induced by the exposure to the, the D4 silicon. Uh, well, cell deaths, there are very, very different forms of, of cell deaths. And this slide shows you an overview. I will not go into too much uh, detail, but this is just meant to indicate that there is quite some uh, different ways in which uh, cells can die. Uh, and this is also a very common process. If you look in humans, then uh, 10 to the 11 cells or even a little bit more uh, die every day. So this this stresses that this is a very common process and the uh, cell remnants, the remnants of the dying cells will generally be nicely cleared by uh, phagocytic cells. So there are two uh, most common ways of cell death, apoptosis and necrosis. Uh, apoptosis is a form of controlled cell death. Uh, necrosis uh, is uh, a form of uncontrolled cell death. So, uh, cell death is generally, is generally uh, proceeding quite instantly. Um, so what we observed in these uh, cell cultures was, well, seemed to be a little bit more related to apoptosis. Well, I will show you a little bit more details on uh, the differences between apoptosis and, 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 uh, and necrosis. So during apoptosis, the cell uh, shrink, the nuclear or uh, the, the chromatin condenses in the nucleus, uh, the nucleus falls apart into in, in different fragments and the cell falls apart in different fragments. Uh, and finally, the uh, apoptotic bodies that are formed are cleared by phagocytic cells. Well, in necrosis, it's not cell shrinkage, but it's actually cell swelling what, what occurs. And uh, uh, relatively soon after cell swelling in, within the cell, not, not, nothing much is happening with these cellular organelles, but at some point, the cell membrane ruptures and the, uh, the, the contents is released to the extracellular space. So in order to get more information on the, the, the type of cell death or putative cell death that is induced by, uh, by silicon, we compared the effects of silicon with that of uh, a necrosis inducer and an apoptosis inducer, in this case for HeLa cells, for, uh, yeah, for HeLa, HeLa cells, which is a epithelial, human epithelial cell line. And while well, this is the, these are images taken at two hours after exposure to, to these compounds. And if you now compare the morphology of these cells, then the morphology of the cells exposed to the silicon is clearly different from that of necrotic cells and also from that of apoptotic cells. So apparently um, there are certainly differences in, in the fate of the cells upon exposure to, uh, to D4. Um, and we saw more or less the same effects in another human cell line, jugged cells, which is a T lymphoblastic cell line. So what happens in dying cells at the plasma membrane, particularly at dying cells uh, dying by, uh, by, uh, through apoptosis or necrosis? Well, uh, one of the prominent features of the cell membrane is that during apoptosis, uh, phospholipids in the plasma membrane, in the bilayer of the plasma membrane, phospholipids, which are generally only found on the inner side of the plasma membrane, flip to the outer side of the plasma membrane, particularly phosphatidylserine. And phosphatidylserine is bound by a protein called annexin 5. So when an exon 5 coupled to a fluorescent dye, uh, what we see is, is used, uh, this can be uh, applied to monitor this, this process of uh, phospholipid flipping uh, to detect apoptotic cells. And late during apoptosis, when the plasma membrane or the lipid bilayer ru is ruptured, then uh, another compound, propidium iodide, can be used to, to monitor this process because this, this uh, propidium iodide, iodide compound cannot enter the cell when the membrane is still intact, but when it's ruptured, it enters the cell, binds to DNA, and the cells will become stained. This is for apoptosis. For necrosis, uh, there is a membrane rupture relatively 
early in the process. And that means that both an exon 5 and PI can enter the cell and bind to their respective uh, target molecules. So this is, we, we, we use these uh, markers for apoptosis and, and necrosis in, uh, in our cell culture. And these are the results. So in orange, you see the results for uh, necrosis, both for an action five, so the, the flipping of the phospholipids and for propidium iodide, the uh, membrane rupture. And you see that both of them uh, occur almost simultaneously and early during the, uh, the process. In apoptosis, uh, annexin 5 staining uh, is relatively early, but later than in necrosis as a result of this flipping of the phospholipids in the, in the membrane. And during apoptosis, at the late stages of apoptosis, the, the membrane is ruptured if, if the apoptotic bodies are not clear pro cleared properly. And then propidium iodide will also lead to staining. So what, what about uh, silicon D4? Uh, we analyzed, we performed the same type of analysis for silicon D4, for cells exposed to, to the D4. And what we now see is that uh, uh, what we first observe is staining by propidium iodide. But this staining apparently occurs because propidium iodide is capable to enter the cells while the plasma membrane is still intact. And you can see this because at these early stages, there is no staining by an exon 5, which actually means that the phosphatidylserine is still on the inner, inner surface of the cell membrane, and the membrane uh, should be intact. Otherwise, we would also have an exon 5 stain. So this is already uh, also a, a phenomenon that is distinct from apoptosis and, and necrosis. Uh, and well, in, in, in the, the, the staining by uh, an exon 5 at late stages of, uh, of, able, uh, of uh, exposure to D4 is probably due to the fact that at these stages the, uh, the plasma membrane is, is ruptured. Um, so these are were the changes at the plasma membrane. What happens uh, within the cell? Uh, in uh, particularly apoptotic cells, apoptosis is a programmed cell that, so uh, in apoptotic cells, there is a whole signaling cascade which leads to the uh, execution of the uh, cell that's program. And the signaling cascade is, is particularly mediated by caspases, and caspases are proteases, proteolytic enzymes, which cleave their substrate proteins. And these substrates are often caspases within the, cas uh, the cascade. But at the execution phase of the apoptosis, a number of cellular substrates are, are cleaved. You can actually uh, use this phenomenon to uh, monitor the activation of this cascade in cells by looking at the fate of the substrate proteins, like, for instance, U170K protein and topa isomerase 1. So caspases are activated in apoptosis, uh, caspase 3, for instance, and caspase 3 is an executioner caspase, which cleaved the 70K protein at this position, leading to these two fragments. And it cleaves at two sides in the topa isomer 1, topa isomer 1 protein, leading to these fragments. Um, the same cleavages or the same similar cleavages also occur in necrotic cells, although they are not depending on caspases, but for instance on a protein on a protease called catepsin. And actually uh, topo isomerase one is also cleaved by catepsin in necrotic cells, but it leads to other fragments because it's another protease leads to other fragments. So the marker proteins I will particularly focus on is the 40k apoptotic marker of product of the U170K protein, 70K apoptotic marker product of the topoisomerase 1 protein, and the 45K marker, uh, necrotic marker also of the topoisomerase 1 protein. And if you now look uh, or perform these kind of analysis uh, on cells exposed to, uh, to D4, and as a control, we used anisomycin and, and hydrogen peroxide to induce either apoptosis or necrosis. And we, on, on the left, in the left panel, the U170K protein is analyzed. In the right panel, the top isomerase 1 protein. And what you can see is that uh, upon exposure to D4, 
there is a, an efficient production of the apoptosis marker. That's also seen in the, in the apoptotic control. If you look at the necrotic marker, which is the 45K fragment of topoisomerase one, we don't see any uh, appearance of this marker when the cells are exposed to D4. So this is a clear indication that at the molecular level, uh, the effects of D4 exposure are similar to those of apoptosis. Another molecular effect uh, seen in apoptotic cells is DNA fragmentation. So DNA, uh, as you probably know, is, is organized in chromatin and uh, the smallest uh, units within chromatin formation are uh, a result of uh, nucleosomes. And uh, nucleosomes is, is a complex of proteins uh, around which the DNA is, is prepped. And uh, well, there are linker DNA fragments which uh, bridge the gap between two nucleosomes. And when uh, uh, in apoptotic cells, a DNA fragmentation factor is activated, and this will actually lead to the cleavage, cleavages of the DNA in these linker regions, resulting in fragments of 200 uh, base pairs or multiples of, uh, of 200 base pairs. And that's actually what you see in this, this uh, gel analysis. This is 200, 400, 600, et cetera. So in apoptotic cells, uh, the DNA, DNA fragmentation occurs in contrast to uh, necrotic cells where there's no DNA fragmentation observed. And if you now expose the cells to D4, to different concentrations, you also see that there's DNA fragmentation in these cells. So another molecular uh, phenomenon that is uh, similar to what occurs in apoptotic cells. Um, further evidence that there's quite some similarity in uh, the effects uh, uh, of uh, apoptosis induction and the exposure to D4 comes from uh, cells in which the apoptotic process is actually inhibited by a protein called BCL2. So on the left, you see the control cells. You do not express BCL2. On the right, you see the jerked BCL2 cells, cells overexpressing the protein BCL2, uh, so the inhibitor of apoptosis. And indeed, you see that if you look at the effects of anisomycin, the apoptosis control, there's uh, efficient appearance of the apoptotic marker in the control cells, but no apoptotic marker in the cells in which the uh, apoptotic process is inhibited. And the same is true for the results of D4. Cells exposed to D4, the control cells exposed to D4 lead to formation of this, this cleavage product, but it's absent in the cells in which apoptosis is inhibited. Uh, and well, also for the other apoptotic marker, we see a similar effect. Um, so what about the concentration dependence? Uh, all the experiments I described so far were performed with D4 and with actually one specific concentration of D4. Uh, concentration, which means in this case, the volume of D4 in the culture medium is about 1% of the total volume. And uh, what you see here is uh, in the upper gel, again, for the U170K marker, a concentration of D4 of 1%, 0.3%, and 0.1%. And if you then focus on this, this uh, 40K marker protein for apoptosis, uh, you see that it's efficiently produced uh, at 1%, less at 0.3%. 3% and hardly visible at 0.1%. So there's clearly a concentration dependent effect. And if we now compare the, the same results for D4, D5, and D6, so for two silicons that are a little bit larger than D4, so uh, consisting of five uh, uh, siloxane entities uh, or six, then you see if you go from D4 to D5, to D6, that the efficiency by which this apoptotic marker appears uh, goes down. So this means that the smaller the silicon, the more efficient the cell dust process is actually initiated. 
and well, top isomer F1 leads to the same conclusion, so I will not go into uh, those details. So yes, there's a phenomenon that occurs in all cells. Uh, so far, I've mainly focused on jerkat cells, which is a T uh, lymphoblast cell line, uh, and HeLa cells, which is a, an epithelial cervix, uh, surface carcinoma cell. Um, here we have also data for HAP2 cells, which is a human uh, epithelial cell line. Uh, and what we see here is that we don't see any production of the um, apoptotic or necrotic markers. So apparently uh, other cells, and we have uh, also used other cells in the meantime, there are more cell line, human cell lines that are resistant to the uh, cell death uh, induction uh, induced by, by D4. So there are clearly differences in the sensitivity of cells to, uh, to the exposure to these, uh, these small silicons. So this brings me to the conclusions. Um, low molecular weight silicons pro induce program cell deaths in, in cultured cells. Um, although not all the cells are equally sensitive to these, uh, these silicons, uh, it's induced in a concentration and size dependent manner. The smaller the silicon, the more efficient the induction of cell deaths uh, occurs. At the um, Cell level D, D4 induced cell that's different from apoptosis and necrosis. So the, the, the effects, particularly at the cell membrane, uh, appear to be different. The morphology of the cell, the, the morphology changes of the cell are different from apoptosis. And also the, uh, uh, the flipping of the phospholipids is, is clearly different from what is commonly seen in apoptosis. But if you look at the molecular level, so the more downstream effects of what happens within the cell, then there's very clear similarities with molecular events that occur in uh, apoptotic cells. So what are the implications for breast implant illness? Are there implications for breast implant illness? We, of course, we should realize that the experiments we have done uh, were performed in a laboratory setting in, in, in cultured cells. So we, it's certainly not allowed to extrapolate these findings immediately to a human body and, and human tissues. Uh, but it would certainly be interesting to see whether in, in those um, uh, women in, in which, which have been exposed to silicon implants for quite a long time and in which it has been demonstrated that the silicons are distributed uh, to certain areas in, in the body to see whether there are any indications for cell deaths in, in these areas. Um, well, what about the concentration of silicons? Um, I indicate, I showed you that in, in cultured cells, it's clearly concentration dependent. So the concentration apparently has to be above a certain threshold before uh, cell deaths will be induced. Uh, well, it's known that silicons accumulate in certain uh, areas in, in the body uh, and then perhaps in combination with the sensitivity of the cells to, um, uh, to silicons, there may or may not be induction of cell death. But of course, that's at this stage not known. And also the gradual accumulation of silicons will of course have an effect on the, uh, uh, the local concentration of silicons in certain areas of the body. Well, in addition to um, uh, the induction of cell deaths, we should also realize that the changes we have seen at the, the plasma membrane level as such may already lead to uh, uh, or well, affect health uh, of, of an, an individual which is exposed to, uh, to silicons because the, 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 well, the, the explanation we have is that the, the highly hydrophobic silicons may actually um, integrate in the plasma membrane, which, which also has a very hydrophobic uh, inner layer. And when this occurs, then uh, the, the function of the plasma membrane uh, may be severely compromised. And this might also be the explanation why we observed that uh, propidium iodide can actually enter the cells in, uh, before the plasma membrane is actually uh, ruptured. Um, well, I already mentioned the sensitivity, the different sensitivity of different cells to, uh, to silicons, uh, which will have to be taken into account uh, when uh, effects in the human body uh, are addressed. Uh, 
Uh, and another aspect that is related to this, uh, I mentioned that normally the remnants of apoptotic cells are, are nicely cleared by phagocytic cells. Uh, so uh, if the cells die uh, as a result of D4 or another small silicon uh, exposure, then, um, uh, well, you can also imagine because the downstream effects are very similar to those of apoptosis that the remnants of these cells will also be cleared by uh, the same phagocytes. So it could well be that also there should be a defect in the clearance of, uh, uh, of dying cells. And this is a phenomenon that has, has also been observed in, in autoimmunity, uh, that, the, that the defect in the clearance of these cells could also contribute to um, uh, the effects of silicons in, uh, in the human body. So finally, I would like to thank the people who were involved in the studies uh, in, in our lab, particularly uh, Carla Onnekink, who, who performed most of the experiments uh, I, I showed you, Wilbert Bullens, who was involved in, in supervision of this project, and we had a lot of, oops, sorry, we had a, a lot of uh, uh, discussions with Rita, Dr. Rita Kappel, who is a, a very nice collaborator in this, uh, in this field. Uh, and we had also some advice from uh, Henry Dijkman uh, in, uh, in these studies. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs>